When you hear the term church, it can be a really, really confusing word to, to, to many people. I mean, what is, what, what is this thing? What is this? Is church, is it, a, is it a building? Is it a country club? Is it a community center? Uh, is it just a place for activities? Is, is, is church a style of worship? Is it a place to eat? We talk a lot about food, right? Is it, is it a place to find friends? Is, is, is it a place to, to find a, a boyfriend, girlfriend? I mean, what, what is this place? What is this thing called church? And if you were to poll 10 people, you may get 10 different answers as to what church is. And if you don't know what church is, it's hard to be the church. And so Paul knows this. And so he, too, uses a metaphor for church. The top metaphor that, that he uses for the word church in the New Testament is the word body. He says the church is, is a body. So when you think about church, think if it's a difficult concept, we want to make it way more understandable. The church then is, is a body. And everyone, everyone has one body. And, and bodies have members and organs and parts that are interconnected and interdependent upon one another. And so we can learn a great deal then about what church is, what church is supposed to be, based on unpacking then this metaphor that he gives us in chapter 12. So if you would stand with me in honor of God's word, it is a long passage. I'll read fast. You listen quickly too, okay? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member but of, of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body then were, were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of, of smell? But as it is, and this is really important, hear this one, verse 18. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gift of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So Paul uses a, a metaphor to help elucidate this, this picture of what the church is. The church is like a body. And so Paul starts with this. When, when thinking about the church, think of, think of the human body. The human body is, is a unit. We all, we all have one body, even though, even though our bodies have many parts. So we, we have one, one body with arms and legs and fingers and toes and hip flexors and eyes and toenails and eyelids and kneecaps and, and elbows. One, one body, one body, but lots, lots of parts. 
And so it's interesting, the body metaphor, the body metaphor speaks powerfully to both our unity and our diversity, right? We have one body, so there should be unity, but there are many parts of that one body, which equals diversity. And I think that Paul is saying that the church should have a, a delicate balance of, of both unity and, and diversity, which is why I think he highlights in verse 13 racial and social diversity first when he refers to Jews and Greeks, slave and free. And, and basically, this would, this, was, this would have been a radical idea and a radical concept in the first century. Paul, Paul is saying that everyone contributes to the church, that everyone, regardless of background, uh, status, skin color, everyone has a place in the church. So there should be unity amidst our diversity. And so no matter what had previously separated these people, Jews, Greeks, slave, and free, right, they had a lot of things that kept them apart. They had all been joined together, Paul says, into, into one body, really uh, a diverse grouping of people joined together in one body by the means of one spirit. As such, when you think about church, the church is not a bunch of random people from random places with random backgrounds just doing their own random thing. Rather, the church is one body with many parts called to accomplish a specific mission or purpose. Next, I want you to notice that Paul highlights two Holy Spirit experiences or encounters that create our unity. So what brings us together? What unifies us if we're all so radically different in background, status, etc.? Well, Paul says we're all baptized by one spirit and we're all given one spirit to drink. So what's he referring to here? He's referring to, in verse 13, baptism and communion. And so Two of our shared experiences as the church then would be baptism. We're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what? And we do communion where we remember together as brothers and sisters the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that symbolizes or solidifies our, our connectedness to one another and our connection to Jesus. And Paul's like, listen, since we're one... We're all one, brought together, right, based on what Christ has done and based on who Christ is. We're to have, like, proper regard for all parts of Christ's body. And so here's what Paul does first. Paul, Paul imagine parts of the body thinking too lowly of themselves. Look at verse 15. It's, it's almost like, you know, he creates this, this picture that if the foot started to get really insecure. You know, I'm a foot, and man, I wish I was a hand, and because I'm a foot, I'm not very valuable. The hand is really valuable. I walk. The hand can do high fives and right pick things up, and so he kind of creates this. Look, verse 15, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. So Paul's like if the foot started to get insecure with its role in and on the body, I'm not as good as the hand, I don't belong to the body. Or, or if the ear said, I don't belong to the body, body because I'm an eye, Paul's like that, that would be utter nonsense because each part of the body makes a unique contribution to the whole. Moreover, God didn't design the whole body to be one part anyway, right? Like, no one is like one big eye, right? Like no one is like one big ear, right? Like a six-foot ear on the platform. Like no one is one big neck, right? No, what? It's one body, many parts. And so, and so Paul is addressing people who, who had a low view of their place and their role in the church. He's addressing people who felt really devalued, really insignificant, really unimportant. And Paul wanted them to see that they had a huge place in, a huge role, a huge value in the body, in the church. So every part of the body serves a purpose. Like they were there on purpose for a purpose. Like the ear serves a purpose 
helping the body to hear and to understand words. The, the eye serves a purpose in helping the body to see and, and to know where it's going, right? The role of an eyelash protects the eye from small, small particles of dust and debris and sand. You know, eyelashes also warn the, the eye then that something's getting too close. It's, it's kind of like a protective gatekeeper for the eye. The, the nose serves a purpose in helping the body to smell, right? If you can't smell, you could be eating things that don't taste right or taste good or, or aren't cooked properly. And so his point is that, listen, regardless of the body part, every part has an important purpose in the body. There are no unimportant people in the church, right? Everyone in the church is important. And so the reason we should take our role in the body seriously is, is verse 18. Because God gave you your role in the body. Look what it says. As it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So think about this. God is the one who created our bodies, and he has arranged the parts of the human body according to his divine wisdom so that the body functions smoothly. In the same way, God has gifted you so that you would fulfill his purposes and so that the church then would function smoothly. Paul then posed a statement or a question in verse 19. If every part of the body were, were like just just one part, like one big eye, or, you know, all ears, all eyes, all feet, all noses, right? Where, where would the body be? Clearly, there would be no body. And, and then to drive home this point, he, he repeats the theme that every part of the body is hugely important. Look what he says in verse 20. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So here's what Paul does. Paul, Paul speaks to a group of people in the church who have completely missed or underestimated their role in the church. Now he's going to address a group of people who have completely overestimated their role in the church. You see it in verses 21 and 24. Paul then focuses on a bunch of body parts or people who have gifts, and based on how they're gifted, they start questioning the value of other people. And so I think the heart of the issue that Paul is trying to address in the church at Corinth was that there, there were certain people with certain gifts who were kind of looking down their noses at everyone else. Like, I have better gifts than you do. I'm more important than you are, that kind of vibe or feel. And so Paul, Paul insisted it would be insane for, for the eye to tell the eyelash, I don't need you. I can just do this eye thing without you. It'd be crazy for the head to say to the feet, I don't need you. It'd be crazy for the foot to say to the toes, I don't need you. Like, like common sense, that's why he's giving us this metaphor, common sense demands that the opposite is true. The eyes need the eyelashes, right? The head needs the, the feet, right? The foot needs the toes. As a matter of fact, Paul says that the parts of the body that people consider less honorable, less significant, less important, should actually be treated with special honor. You see it in verse 23. So let me, let me give you an example. Toenails, uh, fingernails, uh, eyelashes, eyebrows aren't necessarily like, like highlighted on the body, but they're, but they're valuable to the body. And, and every, time, every time I see... That, that word eyebrow, it, it reminds me of this story. Can I tell you a funny story that has nothing to do with the sermon? It's a funny story. So, so I, I have three children, uh, 21, uh, 19, and my son just turned uh, 18. And I have two, two daughters and a son. And for the majority of my life, both, both of my girls have made fun of my eyebrows. Dad, you have like the ugliest eyebrows on like the face of the planet. You, they, you have devil eyebrows is what they would call it. You have devil eyebrows. I have devil eyebrows. Yeah, you have devil eyebrows. Your eyebrows look like check marks. Like they're like check marks. They're really funny looking eyebrows. I've never paid any attention to my eyebrows. The only thing I'm concerned about with my eyebrows is that they don't like, like grow like tentacles, right? Where, you know, like I'm like a catfish. It's the only thing I've ever been concerned about. But I don't, I don't do anything to my eyebrows. I don't, I don't think about my eyebrows. Well, Sherry was having a, a, a counseling session with this, this lady from Grace. And 
They talked for about an hour. They end the word together. They're praying together. And as they closed uh, their, their time together, this lady said, I have, I have one question to ask you. I know it doesn't have anything to do with our counseling. I have one question to ask you. Who does your husband's eyebrows? His eyebrows are like they're awesome. They're, his eyebrows are perfect. They're, they are pretty nice if you take like, look, they're, they're not bad. His eyebrows are awesome. And of course, you know, I went home. I had to tell everybody, you think I have devil eyebrows. I've got like stunning eyebrows. Now, just so you know, I don't get my eyebrows done. It's just natural beauty that I have that they're beautiful <laughs> like that. Um, and, so, and, so, and so then I was, at a, uh, I was at a Christmas party this past year, and we were, we were all kind of playing this game together. And I got the question in this little game, kind of get to know you game. The question in the game was, what was one compliment that someone paid you in this past year that's probably the top compliment of the year? And it was my eyebrow compliment. I have the best eyebrows in the basement. So it has nothing to do with this sermon, right? But, but Paul's saying, listen, like toenails, fingernails, eyelashes, eyebrows, like aren't, aren't highlighted on the body, but they're really, really important to the body. What do toenails do? Toenails protect the toe, right? Uh, fingernails protect the fingers. Eyelashes protect the eyes. Eyebrows, I don't know what they're for, right? But I've seen some people with some eyebrows that, man, you could be in desert storm and survive because they keep the sand from getting done. You need to trim up those eyebrows. Trim them up. Every male in this place, get to the house. Take a look. If you've got a unibrow, do something with a unibrow, right? And so, likewise, Paul says the church should give special honor to people who don't naturally attract honor to themselves. So we should actually go out of our way, right, to honor those people that everyone tends to overlook. So the only people that matter in this church, right, there are all kinds of people that matter that never step foot on this platform. Hugely important to this church. Like there are all kinds of people who like make this place go, people that you'll probably never see, uh, names you'll probably never know. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but there are people who are praying before Every service that we have in this place, there are people who walk and will lay hands on every one of these seats praying for you, that you would have an experience with, a, a great worship moment with God. You would know personally Jesus. Uh, there are people who take time to come in and fill these seat backs with those cars. That doesn't just happen, right? There are people who are cooking the food, washing the dishes, people changing the diapers, people you know, watching the children, people filling up communion trays. You know how long that takes to fill up communion, those little bitty cups you pour like a... I mean, that takes a long time to do. People picking up trash, vacuuming carpets, washing windows, people serving as baptism host, right? People greeting in the parking lot. Listen, those, those people are indispensable to grace. And, and here's what the Bible says. Don't overlook those people. They're, they are so important and so valuable, so much so that they are the ones who should be honored because they're valuable to the church. So Paul's point is that smaller roles don't mean small impact. Now I want you to hear that. Smaller, just because you're not on the platform doesn't mean your role isn't hugely significant to the church. Like, like, like here's what we know, right, with our own bodies. We all know that things as small as toothaches or ingrown toenails can wreak havoc on our bodies. When I, when I was a teenager, I used to get an ingrown toenail on both of my big toes all the time. And if you were to step on my foot, I would lose my mind. Like one small body part that was off messed with everything about me. Then I had to have surgery. Having surgery on your toenail, by the way, is really, really painful. Getting shots into your toe hurts immensely. Someone cutting into the nail bed to remove the, that's a painful deal. And that's what Paul is saying here. Every small part of the body has a huge role on the body. That's why Paul's like, when one part suffers, they all suffer, right? A few, a few years ago, I don't know to tell you, this is like how sad of a human being I am. A few years ago, I sneezed and threw my back out. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty bad, by the way. Like, so a sneeze, like, no! Oh! Like, and when, when, my back, like, when my back went out, it impacted how I slept, how I walked, 
it, you know, I couldn't get rest. I mean, like one, like one part of the body that's off does what? Messes with the entirety of the body. That's why Paul's saying when one part suffers, what? The whole thing suffers, right? And when one part rejoices, we should rejoice together. How, how many of you have had the experience where you've like been on your feet like all day long, like you've been on your feet and man, it's been a long day. You've done a lot of walking, a lot of standing and you, you come home and your feet are worn out like the dogs are barking, right? And if you ever like put your feet in nice warm water, what happens to the rest of your body? You, your feet aren't going, thank you. The rest of your body's like, ah, like, thank you. Why? There's an interconnectedness with parts of the body that impact the whole body. That's exactly what Paul is saying. That's why God has arranged the human body so that every part is important to every other part. In the same way, every Christian is important to every other Christian, and we, we all matter. Paul restates his stance again in verse 27, and then he lists some different roles You'll see that, and I'll tease these out later on uh, in this series. Some different roles in verse 28, and we'll get into the specifics, because I know some of you are like, I want to talk about tongues. We're going to talk about tongues. We'll do all of that in this place, what that means, what it doesn't mean. But his point is that, what? We're one body, different roles. That's why in verses 29 to 30, he asks like six or seven rhetorical questions, and he's expecting the answer, no. So are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Does everyone work miracles? No. Right. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Right. Do all speak tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Like no one gift, right? No gift is possessed by, by everyone in the church. So there's not like one person here that has all the gifts and we all go, you're the most awesome person in the church. No one in the church has all the gifts. So let's look at our outlines here. What, what then is God saying to us today? And, and here, here's my thing as I, as I thought about this, kind of sitting over, kind of thinking about this. Um, if, if you've ever been in the church where you've got a group of people who kind of devalue their role, or you've ever been in a church where people kind of overvalue their role, sometimes that can, can lead to a bad experience in church. And, and I want you to know, if, like, if, you've, if you've had a, like a bad experience in church growing up, you get a bad taste in, in your mouth, one, I want to say that I'm sorry that's happened to you. Uh, number two, I would say, don't, don't, let, don't let humanity keep you from his divinity. Like, don't, don't let people keep you from Jesus. Understand that, that people are flawed, but Jesus isn't. That's why we all need Jesus, right? And so if you're kind of sticking your toe back into the water today, man, thanks for being here. Thanks for, you know, giving it a try again. So let's focus on what God's saying to us today. Number one, I think he's saying to us today that as a church, we need to focus on what unifies us. Like, like, like typically, we talk about what divides us. We believe differently, we dress differently, we think differently, we go, we're a part of this denomination, that denomination, right? But I think he want, Paul wants us to focus on what unifies us. So as believers, we have the same Lord, same Spirit, same Savior, same baptism, same gospel, same goals, right? Same heart, same purpose. We all have the same mission to make disciples in the world. Like, like listen, we all have, whether you realize it or not, we all have so much in common so much to be unified in and on and around. And so we need to operate in the church like a brotherhood and a sisterhood. We're to look out for each other, to love one another, to speak up for one another. We're family, right? We're family. Everyone, I want you to hear this, everyone here matters. So we need to fight for unity. And so I think we need to highlight and focus on Christ's work in us and on us, those things that pull us together and keep us together. So we have a common salvation. I got a baby upset. I'm sorry, sweetheart. It's all right. I'm sorry. But we have a common salvation, right? We have the same mission as followers of Christ. So let's focus on what brings us together, on not, not on what divides us up all the time. Number two, let's not underestimate our role in the church. Too many people wrongly believe they aren't gifted, they aren't important, they aren't needed in the church. That's just not true. It is not true. And I want you to hear this from me. 
everyone has a place at grace. You, you are valued here. You are gifted. Your contribution matters. You, you are needed in the church. And, and, and remember this. When you underestimate your role in the body, you are forgetting then that God gifted you and God placed you on purpose where you're serving currently. Verse 18. So God saved you. He gifted you. He wants you to find your role in, in the body. Number three, I think God is saying to us today, let's not overestimate our role in the church. And typically what happens is people with certain gifts that end up on a platform have, have, have to be careful to keep their pride in check. So be careful not to overestimate your place in the church. Be careful not to talk down to or be condescending of or dismiss other people's roles or contributions in the church. So, so for the record, let me just say this. No one is more important than anyone else in the church. I'm not more important than the person who is serving in the nursery. And that person in the nursery is not more important than, than someone who's serving in another area of ministry. No one is more important than anyone else in the church. And, and, and none of us has any reason for arrogance. Why? Because God's the one that gave us the gifts, right? So here's how I see this. The reason that we have the gifts that we do is not because we're gifted. The reason that we have the gifts that we do is because God gave those gifts to us and he wants to use us to accomplish his purposes in the world. So we're to use our gifts, we're to play our role, and we're to thank God for using us to make an impact in the world. Number four, I think God is saying to us today, let's honor people who are behind the scenes. Let's honor people behind the scenes. It is easy to honor people who use their gifts in public ways. But let's, let's never forget the people who are behind the scenes, prepping, praying, cleaning, serving, doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes that make everyone else the beneficiaries of their service. Uh, for example, I, I think we should all kind of rise up and call bless those who serve in our special needs ministry, in our children's ministry, in our junior high, our senior high ministry. Like, let's, let's honor those. Let's honor those who never step foot on this platform. And so, listen, today, for example, when you pick up your children today, man, think those people who are serving, like give them a pat on the back, maybe drop them a 20, give them a little cash. They can always take cash, but just give them pay them cash. But honor them, right? Honor them. And then number five, let's remember that no one has all the gifts. So I have two thoughts on this, then I'll close. Number one, because no one has all the gifts, no one deserves to be put on a pedestal. No individual in this church should be elevated and positioned where people worship that person. Not a single person. We worship one person in this church, and his name is Jesus, right? Number two, because no one has all the gifts, everyone is important, right? Like everyone is necessary because no one can do it all by themselves because no one has all the gifts. And that's Paul's message. God has given us a unique understanding into his prized possession called the church. And so when you think about the church, the church is a body where everyone plays a role, where everyone is important, and where everyone needs everyone else around them. And so let's ask God to give us eyes to see our role in the body, eyes to see that every part of the body is valuable. And let's ask God to give us, like, hearts to want to honor every single member of the body of Christ for the glory of God. Amen. That's the church. You're the church. We are the body of Christ, unified and diverse. Not a bunch of random people doing our own thing, calling our own shots. We're one body with many parts called to, a comp to accomplish a specific mission in the world, the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, I do pray today for people even here this morning uh, who are underestimating their role here. That you would that you would you would help them to understand their value, their gifting, their contribution. God, help us to to step up, to serve, to to find our place in the body. Help us not to overestimate our role 
but to be humble knowing that you're the one that's given us the gifts. Help us today, God, to, to honor people who are behind the scenes, to honor those that never stepped foot on this platform. And God, we thank you that no one has all the gifts. And so no one deserves worship except Christ alone. So Lord, do your work in us today. Help us to be the church. Help us to see the church as a body, the body of Christ making a difference in the world today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you stand with me. I did have one funny comment. One guy came to me after the first service. He said, I know my role in the body. I'm an appendix. I flare up and I flare up until I have to be removed. That was, <laughs> that was his role in the body. I'm like, I like that. You're the appendix. And then, then my son, my son and a couple of his buddies are always referring to a body part. That's the way they insult. They're like, you're a neck. I'm like, you're insulting me by calling me a neck. Yeah, you're a neck. I'm like, well, I, I don't have any clue what that means, but it sounds way better than some of the other things that you could call me. So thanks for calling me a neck. But we all have different roles in the body, right? And so if you're confused, like, man, I don't, I don't know what my gifts are, I, we can help you find what your gifts are. Then when you find your gift, God has given you a gift so that you can find then a place of service. Then you can serve, you can advance the mission of Christ, and you also find great satisfaction in your own heart when you're doing something God made you to do. Right? So, yeah, it builds up the body, but also edifies you and nourishes you. So let us, let us help you do that, right? Let us help you find your gifts. You can do that in a bunch of different ways. You can take a spiritual gifts inventory. We can help you with that. And I'm going to put one online here and maybe even give you a, a resource here to, uh, towards that end in the next few weeks. You can take that. Then we can sit down with you and kind of walk through what your gift mix really is and kind of help you to find your way there. Or, or you can do it the other way. You don't have to take an inventory. You can do it by trial and error. Like, I think this is my gift. I'm going to go try this, right? And I've shared this before. Like, if you think you have a gift to work with children and you go work and serve with children and all the kids hate you by the time you're done, that ain't your gift. You tried and there was error. Move on to another gift, right? Like, you can do it that way too. Trial, trial and error, right? Just be humble in that way. But man, God, God, God wants to use you. He really does. And, and here's what I know in a big church. There are a lot of people who like to come in and lay low and be anonymous. And, I, and I, I get some of that. But listen, we need you. We need you. You bring something to the table that no one else does. And when you, when you don't use that gift, man, you miss out and then the church misses out. And I tell you, God wants to use every single one of you in this place to accomplish his purposes. Amen? So listen, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, go get your nothing bunt cakes uh, as, we, as we dismiss here today. Guys, come back on. Come back next week, but make sure you come back on Father's Day get your beef jerky. It'll be awesome, right? Don't call each other necks. There are a few things I need to tell you before you leave. Uh, and listen, serve. Find your gift and serve. Amen. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that uh, the church is a body where everyone plays a role and where everyone needs everyone else around them. And so, Lord, help us to engage. Help us to serve. Help us to make a difference in the world. And I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. Happy Mother's Day. Have a blessed, blessed week. Amen. <laughs>